Hello, everyone. My name is Adele Halliday, and I serve as the general uh, the anti racism and equity lead at the General Counsel Office. And welcome to this gathering for the 40 days of engagement on anti racism. Um, I'm here in Saskatoon with a panel of amazing people uh, who are all gathered to share reflections on bold discipleship. Uh, this is part of uh, uh, Bold Discipleship, Reflections from the United Church in, in Saskatchewan, and we'll have a chance to meet each of our panelists shortly. Um, but first, just a little bit more about the 40 days um, and how this gathering fits into it. So this is one live event that's part of a broader series of events. So if we can go to the next slide. Um, this is part of a broader series of events. So this whole week, uh, the focus is on discipleship and reflections from, um, the, um, from Korean Canadians within the United Church of Canada. So there are a few written reflections that are posted on the website. Um, there are some two featured books. One is called Hope, Peace, Unrest, which was written um, at a previous gathering of an intercultural adventure of, um, of Koreans within the United Church. And another book is uh, when, God became all, when God Became White, they are both uh, available from the United Church Bookstore and both are available at a discounted price with the, using the code um, 40 days. So a little bit more about the books, you can go to the next slides. Um, uh, so here are all the featured books throughout the 40 days. Um, the next book, next slide, please. Um, so one, as I mentioned, Hope, Peace, Unrest, and the next slide. Uh, is when God became white. So all of these are available. Um, next slide, please. Um, also for the 40 days, there's a weekly newsletter that's available. Uh, anyone can sign up for the newsletter and um, receive updates about what's coming on, what the written reflections are, um, what live events are coming up and all of the exciting things that will be happening. So that's available on the 40 days website. Um, and the next slide, please. So that brings us right back here to our panel, this live event. There are live events happening every Tuesday at seven o'clock p.m. Eastern time. This particular gathering, this particular event is one and one part of um, the Korean network that has been gathering over the over the past few days, as well as an intercultural adventure. So uh, we're thrilled that this um, gathering on bold discipleship is able to happen as part of this gathering time. So to introduce our panel um, will be Don Schweitzer. So over to you, Don. Thank you. Um, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be with you tonight and, and for an intercultural adventure to, to be part of 40 Days. Uh, I, I, a usual part of an intercultural adventure is a panel discussion in the evening. And, and that's what you'll be uh, seeing tonight. First of all, to start, uh, if you have questions to post, please post them in the chat uh, and we'll have somebody monitoring that. We'll do one round of each panelist presenting. Uh, then we'll do a shorter second round of each panelist and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor uh, or from the chat room. Uh, I'll be introducing each of our panelists just before they speak for the first time. And also after they speak for the first time, there'll be a brief Korean summary of what they said. Uh, and there, there may be some Korean translation or some Korean to English translation as, as we roll through the evening. So without any more ado, I'll introduce our first panelist sitting here immediately to my right. Uh, Bernan is professor of Hebrew Scriptures at St. Andrews College and in charge of lifelong learning. He was born and raised in Singapore. He did his PhD at St. Michael's College? Yes. St. Michael's College in Toronto. And he's been here at St. Andrews three years? Four years? Going on four. Going on four. All right, over to you, Vernon. Thanks very much. Well, good evening, folks. And it's very nice to be here with you today. Um, so I'm going to take an approach where I, I'm going to start with a story. It's a story of, uh, of my parents, and I'm going to locate it in, uh, in 1940s Singapore, where they lived. And then in the second part um, of my presentation, when we go for round two, um, I'm going to be uh, 
taking bits and pieces of that story and weaving it together in with the words of my fellow panelists here as we address the, the, the theme of discipleship, which is the theme for, for this evening. Well, on with the story. Um, so my parents were born in uh, um, 1932 and 1933 in, in what was then British Singapore. Singapore was a uh, southern tip of the Malayan Peninsula. It was part of the British Empire. It was, it was a colony. Um, and uh, so when the Japanese army invaded uh, Singapore uh, uh, in 1942, and so my parents were moving up towards 10, maybe uh, 11 years of age. Um, so they lived through the experience of the Japanese occupation of Singapore, which um, happened over the course of, of a couple of years uh, before the Japanese surrendered and, and Singapore was returned uh, to the British. So in, in that experience, um, Singapore, of course, being a British colony, uh, lived with the understanding that uh, the British were a superior race and that's what legitimized their rule of, uh, of the other uh, peoples uh, around the world in, in, the holdings, uh, in their holdings of empire around the world. So apartheid was the general rule, uh, administrative structure that informed um, the economic and the political structure uh, in Singapore. But of course, when the Japanese army came in, as they were, as they were um, making an argument for why the, the local Asians should support what they were doing, they were making the arguments that, you know, Asia is for Asians, let's get these Europeans out of these lands. Um, so they were very successful, the Japanese. They came from the rear, and the British were expecting them to come from the sea, and they had all their guns pointing out towards the sea, and they rode down the Malayan jungles and bicycles, and they attacked Singapore from the rear and uh, took control of the city within three days. Um, and, and, and all of this uh, hurrah about uh, Asia for the Asians uh, soon became a policy where the Japanese essentially replaced themselves as the, as the master race, if you will. Uh, and, and, and two solid years of violent persecutions occurred. Uh, the local term for it was Sukchin, of course. Uh, the Japanese were still engaged in a violent conflict against uh, the Chinese in China and many of the overseas Chinese, which makes up about 78% of the population. Uh, in Singapore, was sending money back and, and supporting uh, the, the, the cause of, of resistance in China. And so the Japanese were, uh, the Imperial Army was particularly brutal in its treatments of the Chinese uh, population. And so my parents lived through uh, the two years of occupation, and witnessed the violence. Um, and coming out of that, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's still the case that uh, Singaporeans look back to the experience of the Second World War, and that forms the rationale for their march towards independence, the basic idea being that um, we have to be responsible for our own national defense. I'm going to move forward in the story now. So this is into the 1970s, and uh, my parents uh, own a, a nice apartment, and uh, they've got five kids, I'm the youngest of five, and they're all very worried about how they're gonna feed all of us and send us off to university. And, and my mother embarked in, upon this wonderful idea that she was gonna sublet rooms in a larger uh, uh, apartments, right? And uh, the Japanese were business, businesses were, and, and multinational corporations were doing a lot of business in, in Singapore. And so it was, uh, it was a real catch to get uh, a tenant from one of these companies. In, in your flats. And so we had a, a steady stream of um, Japanese business people going through our apartments. And one of these individuals uh, um, was, was a man uh, older than my parents. And one evening he approached my, my parents and he said, I want, I, want to, I want to invite you out to tea. And my parents said, okay. That sounds like a jolly good idea. And so they showed up and, and it was a rather formal affair. It's a, 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 a Japanese ritual, if you will. And, and he began to explain what the tea was about. 
Um, and he said, I want you to understand uh, that during the Second World War, I was, in, I was in the Army. I never left Japan. I was in the National Defense Force and we stayed in, in Japan. And he says, and, and, and when the war was over, you know, the Japanese governments never dealt with many of the violent acts and the atrocities that their army had committed overseas. And he says, uh, but I, I know some bad things happened because um, my friends in the military came back from overseas and he told us stories and some of the things that they'd done. He says, and I feel terrible that our governments never apologize for this or even acknowledge that it's happened. And they've just always said it's a, it's a natural cause of course of war, if you will. And so then that's what this ceremony is about. It's, it's a way for me to apologize for my complicity in this national project that did so much violence around the world that I know impacted you uh, in a terrible way because I know how old you are and, and I know what happened, you know. Uh, that, was, uh, that was a moving moment uh, for my parents. Uh, they had never heard this from the lips uh, of a Japanese national before, you know, and, and my mother described it as, uh, I mean, she just sat there. She just, she just wept. She, was, she couldn't explain it. She just said something turned inside of me. It was like all of this uh, rage and angst and, you know, that, that had been bottled up was just unlocked in that moment, in, that, in, in the movements of that ritual. You know, and it wasn't the words, it was the actions, it was the contrition, it was the expression on the face and, and all of that. So uh, that's my story. I'm going to stop right there. And then uh, I'm going to talk about discipleship in a contextualized way, uh, interwoven with the elements of the story um, later on as I interact with my uh, my fellow pa panelists here on, on this important theme. Uh, I'm going to uh, provide a short summarized uh, Korean translation. 저도 그 지금 예, 이야기는 처음 듣는 거고요. 미리 그 썸머리를 보내주셨어요. 그래서 그걸 제가 그 번역을 해왔는데 얘기를 들으면서 조금 더그 첨가를 했습니다. 저는 제 어머니와 어머니 가족이 2차 세계대전 중에 일본의, 일본군의 점령하에 있던 그 싱가포르에서 겪었던 경험들을 떠올리면서 이야기를 나누고자 합니다. 이 짧은 이야기는 영국의 식민지 통제하에 있었던 싱가포르의 상황에서부터 일본의 침략 1942년 그리고 1963년 싱가포르가 독립하게 된 계기가 되었던 여러 가지 이야기들을 그 이야기입니다. 그래서 이야기하면서 어머니 아버지가 그 1932년 33년에 태어나셨고 그 전쟁과 임, 일제 침략을 다 겪었고 그리고 그 이후에 1970년대 이제 아파트도 살고 집에서 아이들도 키우고 있는데 어떤 일본 사업가가 초대를 해서 차를 마시러 갔는데 그 자리에서 자기가 2차 대전, 대전 때 전쟁 그 군인으로 참여를 했었다. 그리고 일본이 저질렀던 전쟁 범죄에 대해서 내가 사과한다, 참여한다. 그런 개인적인 그런 이야기를 들으면서 어머니가 눈물을 흘리시고 그런 치유가 되고 그러한 경험들을 이야기를 하셨습니다. 그래서 오늘 이 최근 역사를 제 어머니 시각으로 되짚어 보는 것 외에도 제 어머니가 이러한 중대한 사건들을 어떻게 기억하고 회상했는지를 돌아보면서 용서, 화해, 그리고 기독교적 희망에 대한 어머니의 관점이 어떻게 형성되었는지를 설명했습니다. 오늘 제가 나눈 이야기가 여기 계신 다른 패널, 패널들과 그 상호 작용을 통해서 우리가 가지고 있는 고난의 기억, 그리고 삶의 이야기, 희망이 어떻게 그리스도인으로서 예수님의 제자로 살아가는 것에 어떤 역할을 하는지에 대한 토론으로 이어지기를 기대합니다. Thank you, Bernan and Sando. Our next panelist is Dr. Lynn Caldwell. Lynn's a native of Saskatchewan, a graduate of St. Andrews. Uh, she currently holds the chair of McDougall Professor of Theological Ethics, and she's also a connoisseur of fine coffee. Mm. <laughs> Thank you, Dawn. Um, 
So just to make sure the sound is okay online, we were told we'd be, oh, I'm getting this, so I'm gonna bring it closer. <laughs> um, told we'd get some wild, wild gesturing in the back if we weren't talking close enough into the mic. Um, so thanks, Dawn and, and Bernan, and uh, it's good to be here uh, in this room and with folks who are online. One of the things I've been looking forward to about the conversation tonight is being in the room and uh, reconnecting particularly with friends and, and uh, some former students who are here for an intercultural adventure. So um, that really... Uh, that's a big piece of, of being here tonight, as well as being part of the the conversation on the the topic that we're engaging with, and uh, being part of the forty days um, of engagement around anti racism uh, in the United Church. Um, so, bold discipleship um, is the phrase, the theme, and. As I think about that, it sounds like an identity shaping commitment and a call to action. When we speak of discipleship here tonight, um, we're of course already in the middle of a, a centuries long conversation. And it's one that's always, always already been multilingual. So in many languages um, in the conversations about discipleship and the stories and traditions of Christian discipleship have always been intercultural, diverse, and of, cor and of course, always coexisted with many other identity shaping calls to action. So there's lots of um, things to talk about, lots of places to start. And um, since getting the invitation, that's one of the things I've been clear about it for myself is where I wanted to start. <laughs> and that's with, with uh, my own response to hearing the word disciple or discipleship. Um, and so I've been reflecting on that and want to share a little bit um, that I'm very shaped by and committed to theologies that focus on relationship and on much more communal or collective understandings of ethical and faithful life. And even so, I often find that the words disciple and discipleship bring to mind ideas about individuals and individual actions. What comes to mind is a person following Jesus. Theologies, methods of theological reflection that focus on the collective have long histories in Christianity. This includes liberation and decolonial theologies of recent centuries in, from many places. But of course, the collective, the communal has much longer and diverse roots. So I know that the, the inseparability of discipleship from an understanding of the communal isn't new and isn't unusual. Also, uh, um, a focus on the communal and collective as critical for ethics, for life, for faith, isn't limited to or original to Christianity. Where such commitments are held up in Christian theologies and statements of faith, the sources for collectivist and deeply relational ethics are multiple and are rooted in the cultures, philosophies, teachings, and experiences of so very many societies, religions, and histories. And I think I'm formed in and committed to some of these understandings, at least in part from my introduction to theological studies here at St. Andrew's College many years ago. I'm just nodding in the room to someone who was here at the same time back in the, in the 1990s. So even grounded in that kind of theological work, there's still a way that the word disciple tends to draw me towards these more individualist ways of thinking. And that's something I wanted to work through a bit and where I remarks, not to convince anyone or us that a collective or relational understanding of and theology of discipleship is possible because it's of course already convincing and it's possible and is lived out. But I just, I want to think about it and think about what the United Church of Canada as a church and as a church in Canada and in this historical moment could do and what I can do, especially through an intercultural and anti-racist lens on discipleship to more boldly focus on anti-imperialism as an urgent and collective struggle right now. And one of the things that really matters in such a struggle is to identify with the collective deeply and profoundly, theologically and materially. And I'm reflecting and admitting that I find that difficult and urgent. And I'm sure we all know that for the United Church of Canada right now, and for any of us, this has to mean recognizing our connection with the people of Palestine, our call to solidarity with all global struggles against imperialism, and our urgent efforts to end apartheid and occupation. This is an identity-shaping call to action. 
And because I find it a stumbling block in the way of such deep and urgent solidarity, I find it important to think about why individualism seems to be still evoked in relation to discipleship, at least for me. So I'm going to say just a little bit about what, I, what I've been thinking about in those terms. And so I've been thinking that there, there are at least three things involved in how strong this individualistic theme is when I hear disciple. And thinking about that helps me to consider what might get in the way. So I'm just going to name these really briefly, because what I want to talk about is why it matters to me to resist this individualistic approach or association. So of the three things, one, one I think is my own encounters with biblical story and even like the sort of pre-reflective encounters, the, my original encounters with, with biblical story and the, persons and, disciple, uh, and the persons of disciples in the text. So I'm someone who's been socialized in biblical stories about Jesus calling disciples to follow him including the images of such stories that I still carry with me from early encounters with the Bible. So when I hear disciple, when I hear discipleship, disciples, it conjures 12 individuals and fragments of a story I've known since a child at the United Church down the street from my house. I hear disciple and I think about disciples. I can picture particular images in those teachings. Um, and uh, that's particular in my own experience as one kind of a United Church experience. So secondly, as I think about factors in individualism, one is, is just is popular culture and the fact that Christianity in popular culture is part of my and perhaps in many ways all of our consciousness and it impacts the way I make sense of things um, alongside, make sense of things alongside all the ways that, so it, so what I encounter in the circulation of images about Christianity and discipleship and Jesus um, it informed me as much as my deliberate reflection and, and embrace and convictions around a communal theology of, of incarnation. I just realized that my Christological understandings, my, my, my own formation um, around understandings of discipleship and interpretations of text is influenced by how Jesus appears in, in movies and social media and, and how discipleship circles in that way. And then the third thing that I would name is, and I'm using the term neoliberalism to describe this, um, would be neoliberalism and in, in, in society and particularly in my own experiences in, in Canada. So neoliberalism is a way of describing many aspects of modern society that involve a focus on the individual. And even as a critic of that, I'm still shaped by it. Um, there's just a lot that undermines our solidarity with each other and that seems to interfere with bold investments. And I mean financial, political investments in um, human solidarity. And I know that in my own spirituality and politics and self, as much as I'm in the good company of many, many others who strive for that to be otherwise, I know I'm influenced by the values of a dominant culture and economic order that's, that is shaped by the interests of the already powerful and that's uh, part of what invests in this um, modern individualism. So that's three kinds of things that, that I find make this individualistic idea of discipleship kind of sticky. But remembered Bible stories, popular culture, and neoliberalism. So one opportunity in the United Church's vision of bold, bold discipleship for me, I think, could be to wrestle with getting unstuck from individualism because of how attached it is to a cultural and economic order that causes and has always relied on so much, too much, <laughs> death and horror. This, at least in part, can also mean to wrestle more deliberately, denominationally, and urgently with how neoliberalism and neoliberal individualism constrains Christian, constrains Christian engagement with what could really be possible for intercultural, interreligious, and interfaith solidarity, peace, and liberation. Um, more is possible, as we all know, and more is needed in that effort right now. So I just want to say some things about that in relation to our conversation. And just to situate myself in that a bit more. I'm particularly motivated as an educator in the Canadian prairies, as a non-Indigenous person, to wrestle with my own part in ongoing and escalating settler colonialism here and globally. So I want to understand and do what's possible to resist oppressive nationalisms and racisms and anything that defends even tangentially the destruction we're witnessing in Gaza, Lebanon, and the West Bank right now. I recognize that the work of bold discipleship has to involve collective efforts to understand, name, and stop this. 
and neoliberal individualism gets in the way of understanding, naming, and confronting the problem of escalating settler colonialism, at least in part when we get stuck in stories that fit too well with the culture of Canada itself, a settler colonial nation. That affects understandings of discipleship too. We are all living in the conditions of imperialism, settler colonialism, and apartheid. We're not all located in the same way, um, in the same way in its present or in its histories. What we need takes us collectively in conversations with voices in all traditions and languages who seek peace, especially peace immediately for those who are under apartheid and occupation. What are the possibilities in bold discipleship as an identity shaping call to action? What's possible when we consider discipleship as responding and following in non-individualistic ways and in ways that really recognize and reckon with interculturality and anti-imperialism in the Canadian and global societies of which the United Church is a part. What's possible, I think, is an understanding of discipleship as forms of response to and ways to follow the movements for global solidarities against genocide and apartheid, solidarities among the peoples of the earth, led by the peoples of the earth who right now are organizing against these brutalities, and are showing the revolutionary possibilities for peace and justice. It is, it is urgent and possible that we do our reckoning with settler colonialism. And, um, and I know that's something that we, we want to do and we're committed to do. And especially if discipleship really involves learning the way, which is one way of, another way of conceiving of what discipleship is. This is something I think about when I consider the words of Reverend Dr. Mutter Isak of the Evangelical Christian Church, Christmas Church in Bethlehem in an interview recently from Bethlehem in the occupied West Bank. So this is a paraphrase from a portion of that interview um, in which I hear him talking about a wish that people would rediscover an element of Jesus and the ethics of Jesus, not as something of the individual manner, like this is how you would treat your neighbor, but rediscovering that Jesus lived and taught in a politically charged environment and was born under occupation. Isaac's words in that interview and on other occasions resonate with many other voices, many so urgently from across religious traditions and geographies making very, very plain that the identities and actions we need to be shaping out of whatever our traditions and cultures and however stuck we might be in, in other stories are identities and actions that require all of our best efforts, theologies, and courage. Learning the way, following the way, has to be the way out of the perpetuation of such terrors as are happening right now in Gaza, in the West Bank, in Lebanon. Bold discipleship has to mean we keep turning and following the movements out of occupation, apartheid, and genocide. I do not know the way out, but I believe that searching for it wholeheartedly together has to be what discipleship means. And I'm not sure if anything is more important right now. And we are not alone. So my... <clears throat> 썸머리 미리 보내준 걸 제가 바탕으로 해서 먼저 말씀드리겠습니다. 그 일단 제자, 제자도라고 하는 단어를 들으면 항상 이게 개인의 행동, 개인의 신앙으로 그 들려 듣게 되고 이해하게 되는데 그 이유가 세 가지를 이야기했습니다. 그 먼저는 우리가 그 성서에 대해서 성찰과 분석을 하기 이전부터 어려서부터 계속 듣던 그 예수님의 열두 제자들 이야기나 그런 성경 이야기들 때문에 먼저 그렇고요. 두 번째는 대중문화 속에서 나오는 예수님의 제자나 예수님의 이야기가 그런, 어, 그런 영향을 받을 수 있고 또세 가지로 마지막 중요한 게 신자유주의, 니올리버럴리즘을 얘기합니다. 그래서 그 당사자도 학자로서 신자유주의를 반대하는 입장에서도 여전히 이러한 사고방식에 일정한 영향을 받는다고 합니다. 그 신자유주의적이라는 것이 현대 많은 것을 개인주의적인 차원에서 초점을 맞춰서 설명하는 방식이라고 합니다. 그래서 특별히 요즘에 그 이야기되는 인터컬처럴 미니스트리나 또는 엔티레이시즘이나 또는 평화와 해방 그리고 그 팔레스틴에서 벌어지고 있는 그런 전쟁과 파괴, 억압 이런 것들에 집단적으로 같이 직면하고 맞서서 노력해야 되는데 
왜 그것이 안 될까 하는 그것이 신자유주의적인 개인주의가 우리를 우리로 하여금 그렇게 집단적으로 함께 공동의 노력을 하는 것을 방해한다고 이야기를 합니다. 그래서 연합교회가 하나의 공동체로서 이 특히 또그 연합교회도 캐나다가 우리가 살고 있는 캐나다 자체도 정착민 식민주의 국가로 발전해 온 역사 속에 우리가 또 갇혀 있다는 것도 이야기를 했습니다. 그래서 결론적으로 우리가 개인주의적인 방식이 아닌 공동체적인 관점에서 예수님의 부르심에 응답하고 예수님의 길을 따라가는 그러한 노력 가운데 디사이플 제자도라는 노력으로 캐나다와 또 지구촌에서 벌어지고 있는 신자유주의, 식민주의, 인종차별에 대해서 어떻게 일어나고 있는지를 연구하는 데좀더 노력을 기울여야 한다라고 말씀했습니다. Thank you, Lynn and Sando. Our third panelist is Dr. Becca Whitla. Becca is Lydia Grushi, Professor of Practical Ministry. She teaches worship, preaching, practical theology here at St. Andrews. Thank you. I love the theme of this gathering, bold discipleship. And I love that it was connected this afternoon, or at least it was supposed to be, to building God's beloved community. Um, I also feel a bit self-conscious after Lynn's presentation because I'm going to talk about uh, going to begin by talking about discipleship personally, so on the level of the individual. But I want to uh, reclaim that as not individualistic, but deeply personal and deeply born out of relationship, and knit it back together with what I think is uh, the crucial collectivist. Impulse that we all need to take hold of in bold discipleship. So I'm I'm going to begin really personally by speaking about discipleship and expressing my gratitude to some of the mentors in my life. Many of them were my teachers, like my childhood piano teacher. I was trained by the best. Her name, Claire Heffler. She taught me how to pour out my heart, pour out my spirit, and Mion knows about this and some others of you who are musical, into music making so that it could be beautiful, connecting me and others to the transcendent through music. I want to celebrate that. I also pay tribute to Michael Creel, who introduced me to liberation theology in a course I took at York University decades ago. I honor him as an Anglican priest, as a professor, and as a staunch advocate for refugees, for, he, for which he was or, awarded the Order of Canada earlier this year. And he, he, just, he died um, just a few weeks ago. And this is his stole. So I'm going to actually put it on. in the way of a deacon who serves and seeks justice. In the same spirit of honoring ancestors, I'm going to say the name out loud, Chris Lind, because he's a person who some of us here share as a, as a mentor, and he was a principal of St. Andrew's College. I, and I honor my doctoral supervisor, Bill Curvin, along with colleagues, Michelle Andraus, Lee Cormie, and Nestor Medina, each of whom has challenged me and accompanied me to become a better scholar, teacher, and agitator for justice, especially decolonial justice, as a bold disciple following in Jesus's revolutionary steps. These folks are still my mentors, but they also are now my dear friends. Their friendship and solidarity give me glimpses of God's beloved community. My circle of bold discipleship extends into this room as well and includes my colleagues on this panel and many of you in this room, former students and colleagues and friends. And my circle 
of bold discipleship includes my family. So today I honor my mother, who really modeled interculturality for me, and my grandmother, and my grandfather, um, who were not afraid to speak up and stand up for justice. My grandmother traveled with my grandfather in her early 20s to be a missionary in Japan. And this is where my story intersects a little with uh, Vernon's. They were missionaries for the United Church of Canada. Her bold discipleship left a lasting imprint on my family in the intercultural fabric that knits us together. And uh, one of the ways that it shapes me, this imprint from Japanese culture is in honoring teachers and mentors. I share these vignettes as brief illustrations of the importance of these crucial relationships in preparing me to commit to following Jesus. Mentoring relationships, relationships built on discipleship, are the strands in the web of God's beloved community to which Jesus is calling us. And so I'm going to actually light a candle. I know you've already had it lit, but I teach worship, so I can't resist. There's a candle on the table, and but I'm going to light it in memory of all of our ancestors who have helped us to be bold disciples. Ancestors and mentors. And Lynn's going to help me because I can't do it and hold the mic at the same time. Thanks. I'm gonna to turn to scripture for the second half and specifically to Paul's letter to the Philippians, the kenosis passage or the Christ hymn in chapter two, verses five to 11. Here in a reverse power move, God becomes human, emptying God's self by becoming utterly vulnerable as a human refugee baby and participating in the entire life cycle from birth to death. God, through Jesus, is bound with us in experiencing life's beauty and joys, its pain and suffering, from the pain, blood, blood sweat, excrement, and danger of birthing, through life's struggles to the vulnerability of death, and of course, the resurrection. This divine solidarity with humanity is at the heart of our faith. The Greek word used in this passage is dul. And now I'm going to be self-conscious because John's in the room, who's a biblical scholar. But anyhow, and so is Burnham. But uh, okay, anyhow, here I go. <laughs> um, the Greek word is doulos, and it's usually translated as servant or slave. It's related to the Greek verb deo, to bind someone. But the word also means disciple, and it's used throughout the New Testament as disciple. And it's also used by Mary in Luke to describe herself in the feminine, doula, um, in relation to the divine. And today, doula is often used to describe a birth coach or companion. This kind of discipleship, doulos, douloi, doula, of God becoming human as doulos, or even doula, let's stretch our imagination, can help us reimagine discipleship in a bold key. As disciples of Je Jesus, we too can ourselves be bonded servants in relation to Mother Earth, other human beings, and all of creation. How would we then respond to the cries of the earth, the cries of our brothers and sisters in Palestine and Lebanon, along with the cries uttered by her indigenous and racialized children and the countless species facing extinction? This passage offers a way to understand how white settler Canadian Christians like me could adopt a stance of self-giving or self-emptying as a way of opening out to another. By this, I mean self-limiting or relinquishing one's privilege and power as a form of discipleship. So for me, it's an act of making space for something new, listening to, in relationship with, and guided by Indigenous and racialized people. This is a decolonial move, but it's also an intercultural move. And it's also 
done right, an anti-racist move. And so that means I need to, I'm not doing this right now, but I basically need to shut up and listen to all of you. I also think that this passage offers possibility for all Christians, settler, indigenous, and immigrant. My friend and colleague Nestor Medina calls this pneumatological cultural kenosis. For him, it is more than an emptying gesture of relinquishing power. It requires, and here I quote him, moving toward enrichment, the taking on of or opening out to the cultures of others. Driven by the Holy Spirit, pneumatologically driven, this um, taking on entails, as he puts it, the daring act of recognizing the, act, the activity of the divine in the complex interchange of cultural traditions as all infused by the Holy Spirit. My way of understanding this call is as a kind of bold discipleship in an intercultural key. Empowered by the Holy Spirit, we open up to each other as people in relationship with the shared task of building God's beloved community. Yeah, 앞에서 린이 그 개인주의적인 신자유주의를 얘기했는데 그 자기가 이야기하는 개인 개인적인 경험은 이게 개인주의적인 관점이 아니라 개인적인 이야기가 모아져서 집단적인 그런 그 관점으로 이렇게 봐달라고 하면서 개인적인 이야기를 시작합니다. 제 삶의 멘토들에 대한 감사를 표현하면서 이 주제인 제자도에 대한 제 발언을 시작하고 싶습니다. 어린 시절 그 피아노를 가르쳐 주신 분, 또 해방 신학을 저희 그 소개해 준 대학 교수님 마이클 크릴, 그 최근에 돌아가셨는데 돌아가시기 직전에 오더 캐나다 그 상도 수상하시고 좀 전에 그 분을 존경 기리면서 스토를 하고 발표를 했습니다. 그리고 박사 과정 지도해 주신 빈 컬번 같이 공부했던 동료들 또 여기 계신 패널 분들 여러분들 모두가 다그 자신이 더 나은 학자, 교사 그리고 정의를 위한 활동가가 되도록 격려해 주, 격려하고 함께 해 주셨습니다. 특히 자신에게 있어서 인터컬처럴 다양한 그 문화 간의 소통의 중요성을 몸소 실천해주고 가르쳐 주신 분은 어머니, 할머니, 할아버지라고 하십니다. 할머니, 할아버지가 1920년대 일본의 캐나다 연합교회 선교사로 선교 활동을 하셨습니다. 그래서 이러한 그리고 또 이러한 그 일본에서의 그런 경험이나 또 많은 그 믿음의 조상 또 스승을 기리면서 그 촛불도 그 키고 계속 진행을 했습니다. 이러한 멘토 관계는 제자도를 바탕으로 한 관계이고 예수님께서 우리를 부르시는 하나님의 공동체의 한 부분을 이루는 실타래입니다. 그 다음에 이제 성서 본문을 이야기를 했는데요. 빌리포서 2장 5절부터 11절에 나오는 케노시스 구절, 그리스도 창가, 하나님의 지위에서 내려와서 인간의 몸이 되고 인간의 경험에 참여하는 그런 거기에서 그리스 단어, 그리 단어에서 둘로스라고 하는 단어가 일반적으로 종, 노예라고 번역이 되는데 그것이 네오라고 하는 어원에서 묵, 묵다, 결속시키다 뭐 그런 뜻이 있다고 합니다. 근데 또이 단어가 제자라는 의미로도 쓰인다고 합니다. 그리고 누가 보면서 예수, 그 예수님의 어머니 마리아가 마리아 창가, 내가 하나님의 종입니다 라고 했을 때 둘로아라는 여성 어미로 사용해서 표현했고 또 현대 들어서는 둘로아라는 단어가 아기를 출산해 돕는 산파, 조력자 이렇게도 사용한다고 합니다. 그래서 이그 디사이플십과 둘로스라는 개념을 지구, 또 인류, 모든 창조물과의 관계에서 특히 팔레스틴이나 또 멸종 위기에 있는 생물 이리까지 모든 사람, 모든 창조물을 그 관계 안에서 새로운 제자도를 개념을 상상하도록 돕는다. 뭐 이렇게 얘기했습니다. 그리고 또 다른 면에서 캐나다 백인 정착민들에게 이 둘로스라고 하는 그 제자도가 자신의 권력과 특권을 제한하고 포기하는 케노시스 같이 포기하는 것으로도 나타날 수 있고 또 그리스도인들 정착민 선주민 이민자들 모두에게도 예수님이 보여주신 자기를 비우는 케노시스를 
자신의 권력을 포기하는 그리고 다른 사람들에게 마음을 열고 다가가는 행동으로 디사이플십의 모습이 나타날 수 있습니다. 라고 했습니다. Thank you, Becca and Sando. Our fourth panelist is Reverend Sando Hoon. Uh, Sando is a graduate of St. Andrews and he's in paid accountable ministry at the United Church in Meadow Lake. And Sando was one of the first Korean students to come to St. Andrews. And he helped lead the way for many others whose presence greatly enriched the life of the college. Hi, everyone. My name is Sando Hyun, and thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation on discipleship. I have uh, some uh, PowerPoint slides. And I have been in congregation ministry with the United Church of Canada since 2014, when I began my admission process into the United Church of Canada as an ordained minister from the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea. So my presentation today is based on uh, my experience and reflection on congregational ministry in both contexts. So discipleship in communities on faith. Uh, first of all, I'd like to put today's topic discipleship into the context of the United Church's new call and vision. Next slide, yes. Uh, the deep spirituality, bold discipleship and daring justice. I love this new vision and my people in my congregation really love and appreciate this simple and inspiring expression of faith. However, when I try to go deeper into a conversation about what this new vision looks like in a community of faith, it wasn't easy to share a clear understanding together. And thankfully, I had an opportunity to join a series of rural ministry town hall gatherings organized by the National Church where uh, we discuss and share insight about the new vision and what it means, what it looks like in the life and work of the church, particularly in rural context. So thanks to the online gathering, I got a better understanding of the new vision through the image of tree. Next slide, please. So it reminds me of biblical passages, such as the parable of the seed planter, there's some seed, fell on the good soil and grew strong and gave a harvest hundred times more. It also reminds me of Jesus' teaching of the vine and branch relationship. Click, please. So I think deep spirituality is about nurturing our sense of connection with God and with others, a sense of belonging and community where we find support and strength in times of trial. Through worship, fellowship, pastoral care, and church gatherings, we can stay connected with the holy mystery and one another in a community of faith. Click, please. While deep spirituality primarily takes place on personal level and within the community of faith, daring justice is more outward looking. It focuses on making the church more visible in wider community by making positive impact and contributions. And this also involves in engaging social justice movement and outreach ministries. And click, please. So in this context, bold discipleship means a strong commitment and intentional effort and uh, intention of uh, faithfulness to Jesus and the community of faith. It involves putting intentional effort and energy into the work of the Christian ministry and actively participating by offering different talents and gifts we've been given. You know the parable of the talent in the Bible where the servants are given different talents and yet called to utilize them in ministry. So discipleship also involves growing in faith, hope, and love, and building up and strengthening community. 
it also opens us to learning and embracing new ways of doing ministry with curiosity and adaptability. Also, having a self-identity as followers of Jesus is also a significant aspect of discipleship. And I often tell my congregation, don't be shy to tell you are a Christian, a follower of Jesus. Don't be shy to say, speak about your church and its ministries in wider community. I also believe that a poor discipleship means we never be shy to share our Christian faith witness with others, like evangelism we talked about early this morning, and help them find their way to Jesus Christ and to a community of faith. So that is my understanding of discipleship in the context of congregation ministry. However, in reality, and from my experience, not every church, not every denomination thrives in all three aspects. So each congregation and denomination has its strengths and weakness. So next slide, please. So I revised the framework as a multidimensional triangle rather than a single tree. For example, click please. In my experience and perception, churches in Korea emphasize nurturing and spirituality and discipleship. From early morning prayer gathering to Sunday morning and Wednesday evening worship service, from small group gatherings during the weekdays to Sunday school, youth activities and adult Bible gatherings, they put a lot of energy into faith formation and discipleship training. However, they place less focus on the church's role in social ministry and social justice movement. Click, please. On the other hand, United Church of Canada is a strong commitment to social ministries and solidarity work with the oppressed people in, in wider society. This includes social justice, in economic and environmental justice, truth and reconciliation, affirming ministry, anti-racism, intercultural ministry, and more. However, nowadays, uh, United Church, with its new leadership and new vision, speaks a lot about growth and evangelism in a new way that is different from the traditional concept. So this shift is perhaps because we acknowledge our weakness in nurturing spirituality and discipleship, particularly in understanding and practicing Christian discipleship. Next slide, please. Yes, we can continue doing well in, in our strength and try to do better or differently in our weakness. So everything we do in our ministry contributes to growth and increase in all aspects, balancing out the triangle. Let me stop here and I will talk more about that later. Thank you for listening. Thank you. <웃음> 제 발표 제목은 신앙 공동체의 제자도입니다. 제가 한국 교회와 캐나다 연합 교회에서 사역한 경험을 바탕으로 제자도에 대한 생각을 나누고 싶습니다. 제 주제는 캐나다 연합 교회의 새로운 어, 새로운 비전인 깊은 영성, 굳건한 제자도, 담대한 정의를 중심으로 구성했습니다. 저도 그렇고 저희 교인들도 이새 비전을 매우 사랑하고 조화, 영감을 받지만 실제로 교회 내에서 이것이 어떤 모습으로 나타나는지를 함께 이해하는지는 어려, 아, 어려웠습니다. 최근에 총회가 주, 주관했던 농촌 목회 타운홀 미, 모임에 참여하면서 이 새로운 비전에 대해서 깊게 이야기하게 되었습니다. 특히 나무의 이미지를 통해서 세 가지 비전에 대해서 이제 생각해 봤습니다. 어, 저에게 깊은 영성이란 하나님과의 개인적인 관계 그리고 공동체의 다른 일과의 친밀한 관계를 만들어 가서 가서 의미합니다. 그리고 반면에 담대한 정의는 외부로 향하는 사명을 강조하고 교회가 사회 정의를 위한 운동과 봉사 사역에 참여함으로써 더 넓은 공동체에 긍정적인 영향을 미치는 것을 목표로 합니다. 그리고 굳건한 제자도는 예수님과 신앙 공동체에 대한 사랑과 헌신을 의미한다고 생각합니다. 우리가 받은 은사를 활용하고 적극 교회 사역에 참여하고 또 공동체를 강화하는 노력을 기울이는 것입니다. 복음세 예. 하고 그런데 제 경험에 비추어 보면 모든 교회나 교단이 
이 비전의 모든 측면에 뛰어난 것은 아닙니다. 예를 들어서 한국교회는 영성과 제자도에 중점을 두지만 사회 정의와 사회 선교에 대한 관, 관심은 상대적으로 적은 경향이 있습니다. 반대로 캐나다 연합교회는 사회 정의에 대한 강한 헌신을 가지고 있지만 영성과 제자도를 키우는 데는 약점을 보기도 합니다. 그래서 저는 이 비전을 하나 나무가 아니라 그 삼각형으로 다시 재구성해서 우리가 하는 모든 것이 이세 영역 간의 균형을 찾고 교회의 사역이 여기에 나온 모든 측면에서 성장할 수 있도록 노력해야 한다고 생각합니다. 감사합니다. Thank you, Sando. So we'll, that completes our first round. And we'll just take a minute now in, in, in silence to just kind of reflect and think and maybe write down a thought or two uh, from, from our first opening panel presentations. Okay, we'll now start our, our second round, which will be five minutes from each panelist. And then we'll open the floor uh, online and, and in person here uh, to questions, comments, further discussion. So, Dr. Vernon. So our theme is uh, discipleship this evening. Okay, we're good. Yeah, so it's, we're talking about discipleship this evening, and, and we've, we've gone in uh, to two different directions here. We've been talking about uh, the connections between individuals and connections between uh, individuals in, 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 in forming communities, um, and, and we've spoken of discipleship in those terms. Um, I want to offer some brief remarks, but before I do that, I want to recognize uh, a couple of things that stuck out to me as being providential tonight. Um, the first was that prior to, to coming up here, um, and we were talking about who's, who was going to go first and who was going to go second, and, and I tried to make the argument to my colleagues that I should go second. Um, it, it just seemed right to me. It seemed wrong you know, to put a storyteller at the very front. Um, but, but as it's turned out, it's worked out nicely because I was uh, more focused on, on connections between individuals, as was Becca. And Lynn sort of took us into the community and Sando sort of was a combination between the two. So it was a nice distribution and, and none of that was planned, right? And it's providential. Um, the second providential piece is that I'm very grateful for uh, Don's introduction to me, uh, to Jan Asman, whose who's scholarship, I, you know, the, my first year here and I got me reading and it was in memory studies and the relevance of that for what I'm going to talk about is, is going to be uh, uh, pretty clear in a while. So I'll respond first to uh, Lynn's remarks. Uh, and here I'm thinking about Jan Asman and, and uh, his writings about uh, communal memory. So communal memory deals with the past in that it shapes the past and it selects events and, it, and, and it, it addresses themes with a view towards the community and where the community is in the present. So it's focused on national narratives. And, and, and Lynn addressed that issue because she was, she was commenting on some of the problems with the neoliberal uh, focus on individualism. Uh, and, and what was really important there was that, uh, you know, and I think back, go back to the story here, right? Uh, uh, if, if Oyama-san, you know, the, 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 the guest who stayed in our home uh, was going to run with the national narrative um, that was given to him as he was raised in Japan and went through the, uh, experiencing the war from being at home, uh, none of his actions would have taken place. But because he was willing to, to listen and to say, wait a minute here, there's some things that are uh, not quite right about the story that's been handed to me. But he didn't shirk his responsibility. 
know, he sort of said, yeah, I did, I, I, I did not commit those crimes and I'm an individual, but he says, you know, I identify as Japanese as, and as long as the, I, I draw good feelings from that connection, then I'm responsible for, for the mistakes of my people as well. And, and he stood up and, and made the choice to address that. Well, which brings me to uh, things that um, uh, Becca was talking about here. So Becca was talking about uh, relationships between individuals that are forged across lines of uh, uh, national lines, which often end up in, in, in violence. Uh, and then you talked about uh, kenosis and you talked about pneumatology and you talked about vulnerability and all of that. Um, and I think it was, uh, it's, it's important to me too, because, uh, you know, um, our, our Japanese guest when I was growing up, um, chose to be vulnerable and he, he didn't have to, I mean, there was nothing about his, his past and his complicit, complicity that was known to us, but he chose to make that known. He chose to make that known. And that's been something I've been thinking about for a while now. I've been sharing with you in a different setting. Um, this desire for uh, to seek forgiveness and to give forgiveness. I, that was always puzzling to me for the longest time in Christian thinking. You know, why, why do we want that? You know, but it, it doesn't happen without vulnerability, without telling somebody that, Golly, I really screwed up. And this was what was going on inside of me. And I wasn't, wasn't quite ignorant. I was actually quite, quite knowledgeable of what was going on. But I, I chose this because it was, it was easier. Right? Um, and the last point that I make, and this connects with, with Sando's uh, brief presentation here, Sando sort of brings all of this together in, in, in talking about um, connection um, within community, spirituality, in nurturing the Christian life, but it's also oriented towards the broader community because that's what social justice is, is very much about. It's, it's about addressing uh, systemic inequities, uh, unfair things that are really built into the fabric of the way things are, arrangements are. Right? And, and how it, it involves a certain amount of intentionality in addressing these narratives. It, it, it involves issuing a counter-narrative. Uh, it also involves uh, putting oneself in a place of vulnerability, which then ties back to what Becca was talking about as well. Um, so anyway, just an attempt here to tie together some of the things as a way to kick us off in what I hope is a, a, a rich conversation. Thank you. I was going to say that 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 I was going to 이렇게 이 순서대로 된게 자기가 개인적으로 이야기하고 또 집단과 또 교회 이야기까지 해서 잘잘된것 같다라고 말씀하셨고요. 이제 한 사람 한 사람에 대해 리스폰스를 했는데 린 린이 이야기한 것에 대해서 이제 집단적인 메모리, 집단적인 그 기억 또는 전체 국가적인 그런 역사 이런 것을 이야기하면서 자기 이야기에서 그 일본 분이 국가가 자기가 잘못한 게 아닌데 아 구성 어 구성도 전쟁에 참여했는데 어쨌든 그 자기가 그러니까 나라의 잘못을 자기가 책임감을 가지고 사과하고 하는 것에 대해서 그런 그 자기 이야기하고도 연관이 됐다고 얘기하고요. 또 백화 이야기를 또 연결하면서 개인적인 멘토와 관계들 그리고 이 vulnerability 이거를 한글로 참 번역하기 어려운데 그 연약한 존재 또는 불안정한 존재 또는 취약한 존재 이런 vulnerability라는 그런 그런 개념으로 자기를 이제 용서를 구하고 잘못을 책임감을 갖고 용서를 구하는 그런 자세로 이, 그 했던 그런 이야기들을 했습니다. 그리고 이제 선도가 한 거는 이 모든 것을 다 종합해서 그 개인의 스피리츄얼리티도 얘기하고 또 공동체에 대한 그런 미션이나
또는 의도적인 인텐셔널 어 그러니까 의도적인 의식적인 노력으로서의 그 제자도나 공동체에 대한 이야기에 대해서 했, 했다고 제가, 제가 이해한 대로 말씀드렸습니다. 죄송합니다. Thank you, Bergen and Sando. Dr. Caldwell. Okay, thank you. Um, so I haven't really formulated where I want to go with this, but I, I just have one, one thing that's kind of on my mind that percolating um, that I think um, kind of uh, it's percolating. I'm thinking about it in, in relation to all the things we've, we've talked about um, and just want to link it back to some of the things I'm thinking through. And that's the relationship between and the distinction between personalized and individualism. And uh, so I, to, just to, to say a little bit about that and also to say, I think it's such a uh, valuable thing to wrestle with and have conversation ab about um, in relation to discipleship and, and to ethical living and to, to um, our futures, our communities. Uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting the, the, the good. A little closer. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, so what I'm talking about is is personhood and individualism um, as a as something that that runs through these discussions and and is I think an important thing to think about the distinction and the relationship between. And so when I'm thinking about um, individualism and struggling with that and recognizing that it that there's a it has a kind of a stumbling block for the kinds of solidarities that. That I'm convicted about it and convinced about um, that feels really important to me, and I feel really engaged by having conversations about what's at the roots of this kind of individualism as an ideology and as as a ideology that is really ingrained in the the structures of of global governance and um, and uh, and relations that we need to to um, to, to liberate ourselves from um, and. Yeah, so I find that it's, it's, and so I appreciated right where you started, Becca, and, and saying, because I think you use the word speaking personally and, and putting that alongside, how does that sit with thinking about individualism? And I, and I know we're <laughs> kind of coming in, the, in a similar way into that. And I think it's helpful to think about those things together. And I guess to me, it, it feels really personal um, to engage in reflecting on, um, you know, on, what I can do and, and what, what do I know and how do I engage um, in relation to the life that I live in relation to others. And, you know, so we're all, and I also link that to the image that Sando shared too, like we're, we are in our bodies. <laughs> That's who we, you know, we're all um, located in a particular self and we have a self identity in a particular historical moment. Um, and so that experience of personhood and to think of the personhood of Christ as well, um, can be in relation to all kinds of cultural formations and, and possibilities too. So I think it's important to engage in the analysis and the struggle together about what worlds <laughs> are, are, are we um, formed in and what worlds are we forming together. And, and because of, of the, the known impacts of settler colonialism and imperialism and those ties to a global economic order that wants to cultivate consumer individuals rather than a deep solidarity. Um, I, I feel really uh, personally convicted <laughs> and, and a need to, to follow those kinds of movements. And I feel like that's, a, a, you know, it, it's something we, we all engage in. And so just, so, so I think it is important and it's an important thing for me to remember when I'm articulating these things too, is to be explicit that, that this is also about personhood and, and being personal um, and that our analysis of the structures in which our persons are formed and in, in relation to each other is really important as well. So that's a thought. <laughs> <웃음> 그 우리는 이제 친자유주의가 가지고 오는 개인주의적인 것에 대한 그 비판적인 입장을 얘기했잖아요. 그러면서 또 한편 그그 그 아까 처음에 이제 백화는 또 한편 이야기를 자기의 개인적인 이야기로 시작을 하는데 그두 가지의 구별, 그러니까 신자유주의에서 말하는 개인주의적인 관점하고 그것이 아니라 
의미 있고 개인적인 경험들이 그 개인적인 경험들을 아, valuable 개인적인 그 의미 있는 개인의 경험들이 그 논의 논의에 그 도움이 되는 과거는 구별되는 것을 이야기를 했습니다. 그러니까 그런 이야기를 하, 했고 또그 individualism 아, 그 개인주의가 어떻게 그 우리가 겪고 있는 세들러 콜로니얼리즘이나 또는 그 신자유주의인 이렇게 소비 지향 아, 소비 지향 그 소비자로서의 그런 개별적인 그것이 아니라 함께 그 연합하고 솔리데리티 해서 하는 그런 개인적인 책임감에 대한 <웃음> 그 강조점을 이야기를 했습니다. 죄송합니다. 제가 아. Thank you, Lynn and Sando, Dr. Becca. I think we should pause and have a round of applause for Sando. <laughs> just, uh, um, we're not using easy words, so it's a, not an easy task. Um, I'm, I'm just going to pick up on a couple of things from my colleagues. Uh, this idea of personhood and vulnerability and discipleship. So we as people, I as a person, make choices, and they can be extremely vulnerable choices. Um, and I can feel very vulnerable when it's on the side of justice, when I put myself out there, when I take a risk. It's risky business. Even uh, working, um, working interculturally uh, in our communities is vulnerable and risky business. But that is the kind of old discipleship I think that we're called to, uh, in which we are douloi, so we are disciples, but we are also friends, philoi. That's what Jesus says. You know, I, I, now you are my friends. So I have this image of, uh, so maybe Sando can add this to his PowerPoint. But my image is this it's a beloved community where we come as people and we come with our differences and even across political boundaries um, and ethnocultural traditions. We come and we sit in a circle. And we have a tea ceremony. And at that tea ceremony, we can bring our whole selves with our vulnerability and our hopes and our desires and our woundedness. Um, and in sharing tea, we can build um, each other up in a solidarity of bold discipleship. So that's kind of where you're taking me. Good luck. <laughs> 그 앞에서 계속 얘기한 그 제자도 그리고 개인의 관 개인의 경험 풀슨훗 개인의 경험과 개, 그 그런 것들이 어, 때로는 제자도를 따르면서 그런 위험을 감수하는 그런 선택을 하기도 한다는 것을 이야기했고요. 또 제자라는 개념과 또 예수님의 친구 예수님의 제자들을 우리 친구라고 불렀고. 그래서 새로운 이미지를 제안한다면 동그랗게 서클로 서서 티, 차를 마시면서 함께 다양한 관점과 다양한 백그라운드를 가진 사람들이 함께 연대하고 굳건한 제자도를 만들어가는 그런 이미지를 만들어 봤으면 좋겠다. 그렇게 말씀하셨습니다. Thank you, Becca and Sando. All right, Sando. My turn? Yes. Yeah, I'd like to reflect further on what bold discipleship looks like in Christian ministry. Someone might ask, is not everything we do in the name of Jesus considered discipleship? Yes, we could say that. But when we speak of bold discipleship using this particular adjective, 
we acknowledge that there may be uh, differences in the quality of discipleship. See, so on the opposite side of bold discipleship, we can imagine cautious, meek, timid, and polite discipleship, try not to offend anyone or challenge oneself and others to make greater effort in following the way of Jesus. I also want to draw your attention to D.T. Bonhoeffer. We are talking a lot about him in our presentation and his argument about discipleship in his book, Cost of Discipleship, he contrasts cheap grace with costly grace. Cheap grace is the idea that forgiveness and salvation can be achieved without requiring any real commitment or change on the part of the believer. It is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross. And Bonhoeffer critiques this shallow understanding of grace and emphasizes the concept of costly grace, which demands a response and emphasizes, requires uh, repentance along with a willingness to follow Christ with passion and commitment, even if it means bearing the cross and suffering for one's faith. And I think this is something we need to keep in mind as we work to change our culture and approach to discipleship in the United Church. Tamdean 자신의 신앙과 실천 때문에 경험할 수 있는 위험이나 손해를 감수하고 싶지 않습니다. 반면에 담대한 제자도는 진리를 말하고 또 신앙 속에서 도전과 어려움을 직면하는 것을 요구합니다. 그 디트리 바네포가 말한 값싼 은혜, 그 비싼 은혜, 값비싼 은혜 이런 그 것을 이야기합니다. 그래서 우리가 섬기는 교회와 교단이 제자도를 다시 생각할 때 이런 변화를 추구하는 담대한 접근을 목표로 해야 Thank you, Sundo. So we'll now take another minute just to kind of collect our thoughts and think a bit, and, and then we'll move into the question period. For me, the name of a disciple is not linear or static. And what kinds of experiences make them as disciples? When Jesus met those people, those common people, and we know they are behaviors and what they have done with Jesus. And for me, they become and became disciples through interacting and having a relationship and living with Jesus and with people in that community of Kindly. And what really could make them as disciple 
and even discipleship, which could transform this world? That is my question to you. Do we have a panelist who wants to respond? All right. <laughs> Thank you so much for that excellent question. Just one thought, um, connecting, thinking about the, the, this idea of discipleship, maybe not as a noun, but as a, a verb, uh, and how we um, disciple with each other. And I think that inherent in the word, I think that what Lynn was talking about is a kind of perversion of the idea of disciple that individualizes it and puts somebody on a pedestal and says, we're going to be a disciple as opposed to a relationship. So I think it gets to the question of how, when we, when we choose to be a disciple and a follower of Jesus, we're choosing a relationship. We're not choosing uh, I mean, yes, a person, but it's about entering into a relationship that's mutually accountable. And so, and I think that's what's the problem with the way that the word has been twisted. It, and, and so for me, there's, I agree with you, it's not static. It's an ongoing process, a circular process where we're constantly growing. And I, I just, um, uh, in Sung Sung's uh, sermon yesterday, I really appreciated how he talked about how the disciples were ordinary people, right? They were ordinary people who chose to be in relationship. That was their bold choice, was to be in, in relationship with a, you know, revolutionary leader and to follow and teach and learn and to continue to do that. To, it's a continuing mutual relationship. Thank you. Short summary in Korean. Kim Sung-nam 목사님이 이제 제자도가 직선인도 아니고 정해져 있는 것도 아닌데 그 생각하기로는 그 예수님의 제자들이 행동을 통해서 제자도를 따랐는데 어떻게 생각하냐고 말씀하셨을 때 백화는 그 동의하면서 제자도가 그 명사가 아니라 동사로 만약에 그더 다시 한다면 개인주의적인 그 우리가 제자가 될때 우리가 예수님과의 관계 안으로 그러니까 관계 서로가 책임을 지는 그런 관계로 들어가는 것을로 이야기했고 또 어제 여는 예배에서 박선수 목사님이 얘기한 그런 일반 예수님이 제자들이 특별한 사람이 아니라 그냥 일반적인 사람인데 그 사람들이 예수님과의 관계에 들어가기로 선택한 것을 강조하셨습니다. 
Hebrew conception of things, uh, your son, your firstborn, your male child is the only thing that's left of you once you're gone. So that is your heritage. That is the part of you that continues. So to offer the child is to say, I surrender my future to you. I give it up. A similar concept there. And that is the requirements there. And I want to bring the two passages together and, and, and essentially say that it's, 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 it has to do with intention, making choices. Uh, it has to do with, uh, with surrender and repentance, turning around in the sense of uh, turning away from self-interest, if you will, control of one's destiny. And we're back to vulnerability. Discipleship 따르는 그런 용기도 필요하다고 얘기했고요. 또 제네시스 그 저기 창세기 22장에서 아브라함한테 이삭을 바쳐라 라고 했던 그 이야기를 통해서 현재 자기 가진 것을 다 포기하고 미래를 하나님께 맡기는 그런 선택 그리고 자기 자신을 그런 아주 어려운 위험한 또 again vulnerable 그 그것 그런 상황으로 만드는 용기 뭐 이런 얘기를 했어요. Thank you. Hi, I'm Taylor Croissant. Um, Becca got me thinking about etymology, and then Bernard answered half of my question. So thanks, Bernard. Um, about um, disciple comes from the word discipline, so submitting ourselves to a discipline. So you've said that with surrender. I'd like you to say more about the discipline aspect of it, it's submitting to the discipline of a teacher. So more about discipline, please. Tell them about no extensions on assignments. <laughs> <laughs> if, you, if you caught that, that was um, Dawn, who was a professor of the question asker. And as was I. <laughs> um, so I, I appreciated where you ended with that about um, the discipline of teaching. Or you said, or you mentioned submitting to the addition of, te of teaching. So I'm thinking about learning. And so, um, so the invitation was to think about where's the, like, connecting discipline in terms of thinking about bold discipleship. So one thing that I think about a lot is interdisciplinarity. <laughs> so I, I think that's um, something interesting and, and constructive to think about in relation to interculturality too. Um, but that's not to evade that question of discipline, right? In terms of a, of a keeping and a practice and um, it conjures notions of like um, of forms of behavior and um, and when I think about that in, in terms of, of learning and this kind of a bold discipleship for our times, and I'm actually going to link this back to the first question too, too about, you know, what, what is it that, um, what's the experience of becoming a disciple? And it's that's such a good question. And if we don't ask each other that question, you know, then we're, we're losing, we're missing things. So I think there's something really powerful in engaging in conversation about our motivations, our, our, our ways of becoming, what draws us in, and to do that um, across disciplines <laughs> and across cultures, interdisciplinarity, interculture, interculture, interculturality, um, and discipleship. Um, so that's some of the places where that, that takes me when I think about um, uh, about learning the way or in a discipline of learning the way and what I'm convicted about is, you know, what is the way that we need <laughs> um, and that we can discover together that that takes um, 
interdisciplinarity, I would say. And I, and I think I haven't thought about that in relation to discipleship, actually. Um, but I think that's a, a, something I'll think about. Is it inter, interdisciplinary? Different ways of thinking. Yeah. Taylor. Yeah. Like thinking theology. Yeah. Taylor, in the discipleship, the Anteja do it, the Ankenyamro, the discipline, Hunge, Karachigo, Hunge, and Gose, Pokjong, and Gronkenyami, Otoke, Bold Discipleship, or Yongil, the Sinji, Yagir, Lin, Yusuk, 그것이 연습하고 배우고 또 복종하고 그런 것들이 지금 현재 경험에서 어떤 그 제자도와 그런 작그 어떤 관계가 있는지 그런 질문들을 잘 하지 않는 것 같다라고 이야기를 하셨고요. 그러면서 cross disciplinary 또 inter disciplinary 라는 용어로 서로 다른 그 예를 들면 신학과 뭐 과학 뭐 이런 말씀이죠. 예, 신학과 과학 또는 여러 가지 서로 다른 학문들이 서로 크로스하고 그 인터 인게이지 하는 그런 것에 대한 얘기를 하신 것 같은데 질문의 취지하고는 제가 정확하게 잘 모르겠습니다. 예, 맞습니까? I, I think her next question is uh, Unju, and and um, some of our participants are on online are asking if questioners could please say who they are. Yes, um, it's your Unju secret Park. identity. No. Yeah. my name is Unju Park, and from Shining Waters. Um, my question is: I mentioned this in my workshop um, early on that um, using not using disciples in the church has something to do with the church decline because we are not using disciples. We're using volunteers. Mm -hmm. So churches start to go down um, since we use volunteers rather than disciples. So I'm wondering if you have any wisdom to share how we can um, reclaim disciples, discipleships in our church. Which panelist would like to speak to that? <laughs> yeah, actually, I really, really appreciate and that that part struck, struck me during your presentation. And I realized myself has been also so, uh, so used to that, uh, the concept of volunteerism, not discipleship in the ministry of uh, Christian church. So I learned, I learned a very good lesson from your presentation and and in in the context of uh, congregational ministry, there must be role in uh, ministry ministers and also, yeah, particularly ministers. They can they can nurture and encourage the the member of the church and changing the culture of, of volunteerism into discipleship. And in our group discussion, uh, one of the comments, uh, when, we ch when you try to change that volunteerism from volunteerism to discipleship, people may be scared. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that is also a reality in, so yeah, that is my comment. <laughs> yeah, I, I was just gonna say, we need to be bold, right? It's a, it's a, um, and I think the key is like, when I think about the word volunteer, I think about 
uh, service, and it's not a bad word, volunteer, but we're serving. So the relational part is not as strong for me as discipleship, which implies relationship. And it implies a different kind of commitment. Like a volunteer, you can volunteer this week, but maybe not next week because your commitment doesn't allow you. And so, but if you are uh, making a commitment to a community to be a disciple, then you're, you have to be bold. You could be, it's interesting because I was thinking about the Vernon story about being his parents being invited to tea by the Japanese man and how that was a kind of discipleship that was bold, but also gentle. So you don't necessarily need to be, you know, there's different ways of being bold, I think. Um, But it's, uh, it, there's always this question, we, we, we wring our hands and worry about the decline of the church, and we forget to actually profess and do the gospel, right? That's where the, goal, the bold part comes in, um, in when, whether we're at a protest on the street or in the congregation, it's that boldness. So thank you. That was a great question. And, and I'm still chewing on discipline, too. I'm th- connecting discipline to kenosis and to submission and give, but I haven't, it's not formed yet, but it's just, it's percolating. Did you want to say? Can I add add one quick thing too? When I think about the volunteer, volunteerism um, alongside a a relational description that, that is about um, a a belonging (laughs) to a body, right? That in some ways, the, when I think about what neoliberalism does or a society that tries, that is also, it's founded on kinds of freedom. So we're not like bound up in traditions that are oppressive, right? But what, what sometimes happens is then we think we have to lose all sense of tradition, right? So because volunteerism has some positive values too, but it's also constructed in relation to like a kind of economics, <laughs> right? Like it's, a, that is um, connected to the the things that separate us rather than a kind of solidarity. So I think that attention to, to language and language that creates community and to recognize that we do that in a pluralist society as well too. So they're, um, you know, to, to claim an identity in relation to others that are, that are also about building um, commonality and, and uh, freedoms. Yeah, Pekka, Agolin, Dubunda, the volunteerism, uh, volunteerism, me, the Chaiga Unja Hasiko, Olman Hasin, and Ziga Junior Damian, you get discipleship, Ragaman, you get yes, Nuga Kange, Nega Kue, Dean, Nega, some gim, commitment, Yongos, a Kange, a Chuchamuro, the Pakisi, and then Jun Kegiga Tesita, Rogo, the Yaki Kuyo, you go bold and Dagreso, 루, 어, 그 예의가 없는 게 아니라 젠틀하게 복음을 선포하는 그것이 이제 저항이든 아니면 예배에서든 그런 형식으로도 나타날 수 있다고 생각하고요. 여전히 아까 테일러가 얘기했던 그 디스플레인 그 내용을 아까 성경에서 에베소 빌리포서인가에서 보았던 그 캐노시스하고도 연결해서 계속 이야기를 할수 있다고 생각합니다. So my name is Don Schweitzer. <laughs> and this isn't a question, it's a request. And, and I'm, we've heard a lot about how discipleship leads to growth, learning, and it does. And it leads, leads you into community, to fulfillment, to joy. But I, but I wonder, panelists, if one or some of you could say something also about how you know, if if we're embarking on bold discipleship, we're going to experience failure uh, and, and, and brokenness and irrevocable loss. Uh, you know, the moderator whose name has gone out of my head. No, not now. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> but, but in 1975, and I... It just won't come to mind, but but the moderator was a deep proponent of union with the Anglican Church. 
Uh, and a tremendous amount of work went into that. And he spearheaded that in many ways. Uh, General Counsel and the Anglican General Synod, they met concurrently in 1975. General Counsel said yes. The Anglican Church said no. And, and I'm not saying the Anglican Church was wrong, but all that effort and all that work and in the end, no. And, and I, I think of when I lived at the Larsh home, a Larsh home, uh, the head of the house had to ask one of the residents to leave. He'd been there for years. Said, this person has needs that we can't handle. Uh, and, you know, uh, the Stones did this old blues tune and it had this refrain, it's hard to know, it's hard to know when all your love's in vain. Uh, and, and that's part of a bold discipleship. <laughs> the, uh, so if you could say a bit about, about some of that as, as, as part of discipleship. That's what I would like to say. Whether you have imagined the loss of your loved ones, the children who just buried without any heart, mm -hmm. the loss of a loved one, the disciples they experienced the death of killing of their loved ones. So, so, so Sun Ray is uh, adding on to that about uh, disciples experiencing the loss of loved ones, the, the killing of their loved ones, etc. Come on, team. No, I have, I have not experienced that. Um, and I think, uh, but I think that sitting in this room, it's possible that some people in this room have experienced that, a loss of a loved one due to some kind of bold discipleship. And people do experience that all around the world. Um, and there's, there's that kind of loss, a, a, a loss so irrevocable, to use Don's words, that it breaks us. Um, there are other losses that are also deeply wounding. And I could say yes to that. I have experienced those kinds of losses in the name of a commitment to the kind of vision that Jesus of Nazareth embodied. Um, but I, I also just appreciate both Don's question and your response for the profound weight that it carries. And I, I just kind of want to sit with that in silence because that is the cost that we're potentially talking about. That's what, when Sun Do talked about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and the cost, costly grace, that's what it is. It's, this is not some superficial thing. It's, it's a, a, a bold discipleship has that implication. Um, but I can't, I can speak I mean, I'm not going to, I need to think about it and reflect on it and reflect on the cost for me personally of some of my own commitments, but I've been lucky, you know, and I, and I'm lucky partly because I'm a white settler in Canada. Uh, so those are things that I, um, that I, that are, uncomfortable, you know, and uh, 
And, but I think that's about the risk that it is. So I, well, I'm going to stop there um, and invite others to respond. Yeah, this question reminds me of our uh, previous discussion about justification by grace. And someone asked, what kind of sin uh, in, in Korean immigrant or what, what we are supposed to overcome the sin? So I, I think we, in this seminar a couple of years ago or in Montreal, we talked about migration and mission and that book we can find more discussion about justification by grace. And as a someone immigrated, uh, immigrant, immigrant, Korean or African, or any immigrant, if we say sin as a brokenness, we experience a loss and brokenness when we choose or force to move out of the country and settle a new new country, leaving behind a loved one, struggle to settle down and facing challenges, sometimes racism, sometimes, and yeah, that might be a sense of brokenness or loss from the immigration uh, ex experience. And some people like emerging communities they came to Canada as their, their act of discipleship. And yes, as a refugee or political asylum seekers, yeah, maybe we can, we can think of that, um, that ex example about brokenness or uh, loss in discipleship. I'm going to take a, a third stab at a response to uh, the problem that was put before us. And I want to acknowledge what uh, Becca said about sitting at the place of hopelessness with hope, uh, but with bewilderment as well. And I want to back that up as, uh, as, as really um, uh, a feeling, a sentiment that is not strange to the scriptures. I've been reading um, Jacob Wright's uh, monograph, as he teaches it at uh, Emory University, and he, and, and he offers an explanation for why the Bible was written, why it was compiled. And he describes the Bible as, as a book written by the losers, about the losers, for the losers. It's a very bleak picture, right? It's, it's, it's there to explain, to offer a theological explanation for why it is that God's people failed. And why were they conquered? And why were they oppressed? And how they remain in the midst of hope and, and, and with a sense of peoplehood in spite of all of that, right? And, and within the pages of scripture, uh, there are those elements. Uh, you know, you've got, you've got the, 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 the upbeat passages like Deuteronomy chapter 28 and language of curse and blessing, right? If you, if you keep the teachings of Torah, you will prosper. Your children will live. You will, you will have many offspring. And, and if you don't, then all of these horrible things will happen to you. It's, 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 it's clear cut. That's Deuteronomy in the language of curse. Then you get to Job, and Job says, you know, that's not how it always works out. And, and, and at the end of the day, uh, whether, you know, in words of Ecclesiastes, another part from uh, the poetic books, uh, another piece from the poetic books, you know, whether it's, it's love or, 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 or hate that comes from heaven, love or hate, meaning uh, good stuff or bad stuff, it's a mystery. It, it seems random at times, right? So there's this acknowledgement that uh, things don't quite line up with what we hope the order of the cosmos is or what we hope it should be. You know, it's, it's just there. And one more piece, you know, I think it's Isaiah 54, you know, which seems to completely undercut Deuteronomy, which always talks about how living a long life to a ripe old age is a sign of reward. And, and, and Isaiah says, you know, actually the righteous sometimes die young because God takes pity on them in this cruel world and just lets them die early. You know, so you've got these 
contradictory streams that are competing for your attention in the sacred collection, tearing you apart, and essentially saying that this is a complex issue that you raise, and the scribes who put the Bible together compose and bring, collates all of these seemingly discrepant voices. And essentially, it's the community coming together and saying, how the heck does all of this hang together? You know, we believe in a good God, but this world doesn't make sense. Right? And, and somehow we've got to sit in the midst of that mystery and hold on to hope. That's a challenge. How do you, how do you, how do you hold on to hope in, in that kind of an order that doesn't you know, give you the rewards uh, not too long after the fact, at least, right? <웃음> 그좀 전에 버논이 얘기한 것만 해, 해도 될까요? 네, 네. 버논이 그 바이블 성경이 어떤 학자가 루저, 그러니까 사회에서 뒤처진 사람들에 의해서 또그 사람들 위해서 쓰여진 책이다라고 이야기를 한 학자를 얘기하면서 심, 그러면서 또 한편 신명기에서는 그 말씀을 잘 지키면 벌 받고 아 행복해지고 안 지키면 벌 받는다 그런 매우 선명한 것이 있는데 또 그러다 보면 가다가 보면 욕기나 전도서에 보면 그러지 않고 오히려 또 아이, 아이사야에서도 그 의인이 그 고통을 받는 그런 여러 가지 성경에 보면 복잡 다단하고 대조적인 그런 이야기들이 경전으로 모아져서 그런 신비롭게 또그 가운데서도 우리가 희망을 찾으려고 하는 그런 신비로운 책이라고 그렇게 하겠습니다. This is comment to a question. I'm not sure, but well, it can be a sermon. So I'm stuck. Uh, we can observe two distinct these things. Distinct forms of discipleship in the fo uh, followers of Jesus. So the disciples before his resurrection and those who for whatever reason, confessed that Jesus had risen. I believe Christian discipleship contains these two aspects. The disciples before the resurrect resurrection were those who followed Jesus with the intent to fulfill their own desire or achieve what they personally wanted. In contrast, after the resurrection, the disciples understood the path of Jesus and accepted it as their own, striving to live by it. So the bold discipleship was a sick, in my opinion, is one where we confess that Jesus has risen among us once again and accept his path as the one we must follow. It is about embracing Jesus' way as our, our way and moving forward with that conviction. In Min Jung theology, when discuss, <coughs> discussing Min Jung, there's an often a distinction made between immediate people and self-aware people. Simply, I believe we can also identify immediate disciples and self-aware disciples. 
So immediate disciples are those who follow Jesus without a deep understanding of their own role or the significance of their actions. They may be motivated by personal desires or uh, special reason. Oh. Sim uh, similarly to the uh, pre-resurrection disciples who often misunderstood Jesus' teachings or followed for what they could gain. And on the other hand, self-aware disciples are like the post-resurrection disciples. They fully grasp the meaning of following Jesus and willingly align their lives with his path. This type of discipleship involves a conscious decision to embrace the way of Jesus, not just for personal benefit, but for the great purpose of serving others and living out the gospel. If we accept this idea of immediate and the self-awareness disciples stand the question become, what can be your turning point to us? When might we encounter the, uh, the resurrected Jesus? From the perspective of Minjung theology, an answer can be found in the moment of deep confrontation with the suffering and the injustice will the Divine is revealed in the lives of the oppressed. So, this is my sermon. We're not going to get a Korean translation. All right, we've got uh, two minutes left. Anyone on the panel or anyone care to respond to Kwambom? Uh, final comments from our panelists? <laughs> Vernon says, how do you sum that up? So, well, we'll call. I just want to say thanks. I, I especially want to say thanks to, to Adele and to, to Dawn and to Sundo especially. Can we just say thank you again to Sendo. Um, and I, I really want to thank the people who asked questions. They were really, I, I'm going to be thinking about those questions in the weeks to come. They were really good questions. And I think that through your questions and our conversation, I hope that we can be modeling the kind of relational, anti-individualistic, solidarious, bold discipleship that I think the United Church is talking about. So I, I, I can I, am I allowed to say thanks? So thanks. <laughs> How do I say that? Kamsamida. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, on behalf of everyone here and everyone participating online, uh, I'd like to say thank you to our, our four panelists very much. And, and I'd also like to thank Adele for hooking us in to 40 days and, and making us part of this. So thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>